In 1987, 21-year-old Deanna Wilde had just separated from her husband and she was living with her two friends, Virginia and BJ McGinnis, who were both 54 years old. On April 2nd of that year, the trio decided to visit Big Sur, which is the very beautiful, but very steep and dangerous section of the Central California coastline. They pulled over at a particular cliff overlooking the water to take some pictures. Afterwards, as they were getting ready to go back to their car, Deanna wanted a closer look. So she stepped to the edge of the cliff where she lost her footing and she fell 500 feet to her death. It was ruled an accident, so investigating officers refrained from taking any on-scene photographs, accepting instead Virginia's photographs that she said she had taken right before it happened. Deanna's mother was unable to afford a funeral for her daughter, and so the only person she could think to ask to help her was a lawyer that went to the same church as her. His name was Steve Keeney, and Steve said, yeah, of course, I'll try to make some phone calls for you and see what I can do. And in doing so, he wound up learning about the case, about what happened to Deanna, and he discovered that her two friends, Virginia and BJ, had actually taken a life insurance policy out on Deanna the day before she fell off the cliff. And so Steve began digging into the backgrounds of Virginia and BJ, and he discovered that Virginia had a history of being around a high number of accidental deaths and suspicious fires, and that she had cashed in a whole bunch of life insurance policies. So all of a sudden, Deanna's death did not look accidental. Steve would become obsessed with the idea that the McGinnises were behind Deanna's death, but unfortunately, there was virtually no evidence to support that because when she died, the investigating officers ruled it an accident. So there was no crime scene, there was no evidence collected, the autopsy was very cursory, and so Steve would spend five years building a case against Virginia and BJ, but at the end of those five years, it was a rock solid case and Virginia and BJ were arrested. During their trial, the real story of what happened to Deanna finally emerged. On that April day in 1987, the trio went to Big Sur and they had lunch together, they had a picnic, and while they were eating, BJ slipped some of his prescription antidepressants into Deanna's drink, and so after lunch, the drugs were in Deanna's system and she began to get very drowsy, to the point where Virginia and BJ had to literally hold her up. She was falling over, she was so tired. And so while Deanna's in the state, Virginia and BJ tell her, hey, let's go over to the cliffs and take some pictures. And so they walk over, Deanna's stumbling and BJ's holding her up and they get to the edge of the cliff and BJ turns around so the ocean's at his back and he's propping up Deanna and Virginia steps away and she takes their picture. And then right after that picture, BJ, while still holding Deanna, turned around to face the water and kind of carried Deanna right to the edge and Virginia took one more picture of them facing the water. And then right after that picture was taken, BJ took Deanna and threw her off the cliff. But perhaps the most disturbing part of this case is that as soon as he threw her off, Deanna kind of came to and whipped herself around and managed to grab onto the cliff with her hands. And so she's literally dangling, holding onto this ledge like in the movies, begging to be pulled back up. And Virginia and BJ, instead of helping her back up, picked up rocks and bashed her hands until she fell off the cliff. Ultimately, it would be these last two pictures that Virginia took that got her and BJ convicted of killing Deanna. Because these pictures clearly showed Deanna was impaired compared to the earlier pictures on the camera roll. And the only reason these pictures existed is because Virginia wanted a trophy from the killing because she was actually an uncaught serial killer that went around killing people and cashing in their life insurance policies. One of her victims even included her own three-year-old daughter. BJ would actually die during his trial. As for Virginia, she was found guilty and sent to jail for life. At around 5.20 p.m. on August 31st, 2007, a young couple stepped onto the beautiful sand of Yelpo Beach, which is located at the very southern tip of South Korea. The couple grabbed each other's hands and smiled in excitement as they looked out on the water and saw all these fishing boats that dotted the horizon, and then behind them were all these beautiful mountains. I mean, this was a spectacular place. They couldn't believe that a place so gorgeous and so remote was located only a one-hour train ride away from the busy city where they went to college. The couple's names were Kim and Chu. Kim was 21 years old, and he was an athlete and a very dedicated student. 
And Chu, she was 20 years old and also very studious, but maybe unlike Kim, she was a bit more reserved and shy. In fact, Kim was Chu's very first serious boyfriend, and she absolutely adored him. And in fact, this was going to be the couple's kind of big first trip that they would take together. It was a Friday, and Kim and Chu planned to spend the entire weekend exploring this place called Yelpo Beach. Yelpo Beach is located right against this quaint little fishing village, and it's famous for its beautiful silver-colored sand. In fact, the beach is so famous, lots of people come out here and just camp out on the beach because it's just so beautiful. There's also a very busy open-air seafood market right nearby, which is really cool because all the fishermen come in and literally offload their catch right onto the table, and they sell it to people coming by. And also, up in the mountains, you could see these beautiful bright green crops, which were tea plantations that made the air in Yelpo Beach kind of floral and sweet-smelling. But before Kim and Chu began exploring all the kind of main tourist attractions, they wanted to go check out the fishing pier, which was not really a touristy attraction. It was just a regular fishing pier. But, you know, Kim and Chu had been on this hour-long train ride, and they wanted to stretch their legs, and the sun was starting to go down, and so they figured they could walk out on the pier, have a beautiful view of the water, then watch the sunset, and then after that, they could go kind of explore the main areas. And so, Kim and Chu, still holding hands, began walking on the silver sandy beach in the direction of this fishing pier off in the distance. And as they were walking, Chu pulled out her camera and was taking all these pictures. But then at some point, Kim, who again is holding Chu's hand, he just abruptly stops and kind of squints his eyes and looks off in the distance towards the fishing pier. And Chu, she puts her camera down and asks Kim, you know, what's going on? But Chu, without even saying anything to her, just raises his hand and points. And then seconds later, Kim and Chu were running down the beach. The next day, Chu was supposed to call her mother and check in about how the trip was going so far, but she never did. And so her mother eventually tried calling Chu later in the day, but it went straight to voicemail. And then also, when Chu's mother called Kim, Kim was also not answering his phone. And so by the end of this day, when Kim and Chu's parents had not heard from their child, they did not wait for any more information. This was so uncharacteristic of Kim and Chu, who were always good about checking in and letting their family know what they were doing, that the parents, they just immediately went to the police and filed missing person reports. The police would launch an investigation very quickly, but they didn't have much to go on. All they knew was two adults were not answering their phone, but that was it. And so they started by trying to locate Kim and Chu's phones, but neither phone was giving off a signal, so they couldn't find them. And so next, the police went to Yelpo Beach and began talking to people who were there on the day that Kim and Chu were to ask them if they had noticed anything funny, if they had seen the couple, you know, did you notice them fighting? Were they talking to anyone unusual? I mean, anything. But nobody remembered anything out of the ordinary, and the few people who had seen Kim and Chu on the day they were at Yelpo Beach, they said they seemed like a very happy, normal couple that were not fighting at all, and were just enjoying their time in Yelpo Beach. And so over the course of that weekend, the police tried everything they could to try to locate Kim and Chu and figure out what happened, but they really made no progress whatsoever, and Kim and Chu never checked in by the end of that weekend. But everything would change on that Monday, September 3rd. On that day, a fisherman spotted a body floating in the water near Yelpo Beach, and it was Chu's body. And then two days after that, on September 5th, Kim's body washed up at a dock at a nearby fishing village. Both Kim and Chu were totally unrecognizable after being submerged in water for as long as they had been. Autopsies would show that Kim and Chu also had lots of bone fractures, but it wasn't clear if they were beaten by someone or something and that's what caused the fractures, or if they were just a product of being in the water for so long and smashing into rocks and boats and that kind of thing. But the police thought, you know, this looks like there could be foul play involved, you know, maybe they were murdered. And so the police went back and began scouring all the footage from all the cameras at Yelpo Beach to see if maybe they could find some clip that would show what happened to this couple. And eventually, one of the detectives who was looking through all this footage found something really interesting. He found a very short clip of the couple over at that fishing pier that they had been walking towards. However, they were not up on the fishing pier like you would expect. They were below the fishing pier on the sand. And they were kind of standing next to each other, holding each other close, and there was nobody else around them. 
It was like this totally weird thing. Now, as weird as this was, because it made no sense for them to be below the fishing pier, there didn't appear to be any hazards or other people or anything near them. It was like they just chose to be under there for some reason. But regardless, the police would actually use this video clip to close the case. The police would say that, you know, based on this clip, it appears that this was the final moment of the couple, you know, underneath this pier, and then something happened. Either an accident, they might have fallen in the water or something and they drowned, or maybe, you know, this couple elected to take their lives together. And while Kim and Chu's families vehemently disagreed with the police assessment, there was nothing they could do. The case was now closed. Nobody was trying to figure out what happened to Kim and Chu. That is, until four weeks later, on September 26th, 2007, when two more bodies, two young women, washed up on shore right around the same area where Kim and Chu had. The two young women had a lot of similarities to Kim and Chu. They were in their early 20s, they were tourists at Yelpo Beach, and their autopsies discovered that they had several bone fractures. And so this was enough for the police to launch a much bigger investigation into what was going on at Yelpo Beach, which included reopening the Kim and Chu case. And so a detective was assigned to go back through all the evidence in the Kim and Chu case and kind of re-examine it. And so this detective did look through all these pictures and he would find one picture that broke the case wide open. Back on the night that Kim and Chu were at Yelpo Beach and they began walking towards the fishing pier, Kim had abruptly stopped and raised his finger and pointed at something, and then seconds later, he and Chu were running in that direction. Well, what Kim had spotted was a fisherman who was standing below the fishing pier, and he was very obviously making his way over to his fishing boat to go back out on the water. And Kim just felt like it would be really cool to go ask that fisherman if they could join him and go out on the water with him on his fishing boat to get a view of Yelpo Beach that way. And Chu, when she heard this idea, thought it was a great idea, and the two of them ran to the pier to try to catch this fisherman before he took off. And so that was why there was footage of the couple standing underneath the fishing pier. They were actually talking to this fisherman who could not be seen in frame. The fisherman was a 70-year-old man named Wu Jun Gwen, and he made his living selling octopus. And at first, when Kim and Chu approached Wu and asked to go with him on his boat, he said, no, I don't want you to come with me. But Kim and Chu seemed really desperate to go out with him, and finally he relented and said, okay, you can tag along. Wu was very thin and short, but he had been working on fishing boats since he was a child, and so despite his appearance of being this kind of small, frail guy, he was actually really physically strong. And despite Wu's kind of harmless-seeming exterior, inside, Wu was a very, very disturbed person. The reason Wu did not want to bring Kim and Chu with him out on this boat is he knew he would have an urge that he would not be able to control. But when they kept begging him over and over again to go with him, he finally just accepted that this was going to happen. He allowed them on his boat, he brought them out onto the water, and sure enough, he would act on those urges. Once Wu's boat was out on the water far away from the beach, he immediately pushed Kim overboard, and so Kim falls into the water, and then Wu grabbed this long metal grappling hook and began beating Kim in the water on his face, his arms, his hands, as Kim desperately tried to climb back in the boat. And eventually, Wu literally beat Kim to death. And at the same time, Chu is on this boat watching this happening. And so after her boyfriend has been beaten to death, Wu turns on Chu and does the same thing to her. He chucks her overboard and beats her until she dies from this grappling hook. And then afterward, Wu just got back behind the wheel, putted back to shore, and sold his octopus like nothing had happened. And Wu very likely would have gotten away with these first two murders, except four weeks later, it just so happened that two more tourists, those two young women, just happened to ask Wu the same question. Can we go out with you on your boat? And he would kill them the same way he killed Kim and Chu. 
except one of those two young women, while they were out on the water in his boat before they were attacked, she sent something was wrong, and she sent a text message saying she was in trouble on a boat. And when the police found these two women's bodies and found that text message, they immediately searched the registry that listed all the boats that had been out on the water near Yelpo Beach that day. And because it was a holiday, there was nobody out on the water except for one boat. And that boat was Wu's boat. And this is where that photo the detective found on Chu's camera roll, when finally somebody looked through the photos, that's where that photo comes into play. The last picture that Chu took is of Wu. Wu is right in front of her, he's piloting the boat out into the open ocean, and Chu just took a picture of him, not knowing what was actually happening. That this guy was driving her out to her death. Ultimately, Wu would be convicted of the murders, even though he didn't really offer up any clear explanation as to why he killed these people. He just kind of acted on these urges, so to speak. And he would be sentenced to death and he would become the oldest death row inmate in South Korea. In 2008, 28-year-old Chris Smith was an up-and-coming star in the lead generation business. Lead generation is not a flashy business. Basically, you create these ads that are designed to generically help people with things like lowering their mortgage payments or reducing their credit card debt. And in these ads, you leave behind a 1-800 number for anybody interested to call and the people that do call, their information is taken down, and then the lead generator, the person who made that ad, they sell that information to mortgage brokers and debt consolidators and anybody else that wants access to that lead. Chris's ability to create these really compelling ads and get people to call said number was so good that it caught the attention of another up-and-comer in the lead generation space, a man by the name of Ed Shin. Ed worked for a lead generation company called LG Tech in Southern California, and Ed wound up hiring Chris to come onto their team as a consultant. Right away, Chris and Ed totally hit it off, despite being very different people. Chris was a surfer bro who wore flip-flops and t-shirts every day and never went to college. Ed was a very sharply dressed, college-educated father of three who went to church every Sunday. But where they overlapped was their shared desire to become fabulously wealthy. After working together for a little while at LG Tech and doing quite well for themselves, they realized they could actually make a lot more money if they left LG Tech and formed their own lead generation business. And so in early 2009, they did just that. They left LG Tech and they formed a new company called 800 Exchange. And right away, it took off, generating millions and millions of dollars in revenue, 80% of which was profit. During this incredible time, Chris used some of his money to buy a brand new Range Rover and a beautiful condo in Laguna Beach, and he fell in love with this beautiful ballet dancer named Erica. By and large, Chris seemed to be putting his roots down and really building a life for himself. As for Ed, despite his squeaky clean outward appearance as being this all-star family man and father, he was using his cash to party and gamble in Las Vegas. When Ed was at LG Tech, he would regularly go to Las Vegas to generate business. And while he was there, he developed a gambling addiction. When he and Chris formed 800 Exchange, Ed continued to go to Las Vegas to drum up business. It was something he was good at. But when he and Chris started making money hand over fist, his gambling addiction grew tenfold and he went completely off the rails. Ed was spending so much money in Las Vegas, sometimes up to six figures an hour, that one of the main casinos there would fly him in their private jet out to Las Vegas, and they would put him in their very best suite, fully comped. It's unclear how aware Chris was of Ed's crazy spending habits, because Chris rarely went to Las Vegas with Ed. The men were living their respective dreams until October of that year, when Ed was charged with embezzlement. Their former employer, LG Tech, had alleged that Ed had siphoned off about two and a half million dollars from their business to fund his wild Las Vegas lifestyle. Ed told Chris these allegations were totally false, but Chris was shaken. He was worried that if he didn't do something about this, Ed could potentially embezzle money from 800 Exchange. And so Chris went out and got a lawyer to begin protecting himself from his business partner. Over the following few months, Ed and Chris attempted to run 800 Exchange before Ed's trial date, but it was just too difficult because the trust had been totally destroyed by these allegations. And in May of 2010, Ed was convicted of felony embezzlement, 
In order to avoid jail time, Ed had taken a deal that meant he would need to pay roughly $800,000 of restitution to LG Tech. But Ed did not have $800,000. The only way he could make this payment would be if 800 Exchange, the business, fronted the money. But in order to do that, he would need Chris to sign off that he was okay with that because he owned half of the business. When Ed approached Chris, Chris said, no, I'm not signing that. I'm worried you're going to take advantage of me too. But after a couple of weeks of talking to his lawyer, Chris finally told Ed that he was ready to meet up with him and come to some sort of agreement. And so on June 4th, the two men met up at the 800 Exchange office, and Chris decided to just sell his portion of the business to Ed for about a million dollars, and then Ed can do whatever he needs to do with the business account to pay down his debts. Despite how crazy this situation was, Chris actually felt like this was kind of a win for him. He got a $1 million payday, and now he wanted to go out and celebrate. And so a couple of days after this meeting with Ed, Chris emails his family and says he's going to go on a three-week vacation to South America and just go surfing the whole time. He's chartered this 45-foot yacht. He's hired a captain. He's hired a cook. It's going to be this dream vacation. He also regretted to inform them that he had broken it off with his girlfriend, Erica, but he had a new girlfriend who'd be coming with him on this vacation, and she was a former Playboy playmate named Tiffany. His family was really surprised to hear the news about Erica because they really believed they were going to get married. But the trip itself was not really out of character. Chris had always said for the longest time that once he made it big and had millions of dollars in cash, he would just sail off into the Pacific and go surfing and just be off the grid and live his life in peace. And now he finally had a chance to do that. And so his family said, have fun, stay safe, and we'll see you when you get back. But three weeks went by and Chris did not return to his condo. Instead, he emailed his family again and just told them he was having this great time, that this was the best trip he could have asked for, and that instead of coming home, he was just going to keep sailing around the world and enjoying this time that he is disconnected from society. And again, his family said, okay, have a good time, stay safe, and we'll see you when we see you. But over the following weeks and months that Chris extended this vacation, his emails took a dark turn. Chris started to act depressed, and he alluded to taking drugs, and then at one point he talked about doing the unthinkable, referencing harming himself. His parents were very concerned and told him he should come back home, or at the very least, they should arrange to meet up somewhere. But every time they said this, Chris would just suddenly change the tone of his email and seem really upbeat and cheerful and said, oh no, I'm actually just fine, and I just need some time to myself. Finally, in December of 2010, so six months after Chris has gone on this vacation, he reaches out to his brother Paul and asks him if he'll come to Costa Rica the following February to go surfing with him. Paul was excited and said he would go, and he and the rest of his family breathed a collective sigh of relief that now one of their family members would get to see Chris and actually check in on him. Shortly after this email exchange, Chris told his family that he was headed off into the Congo to sell some gold coins to a trader who was prepared to buy them at a 30% markup, and Chris was really excited about it. After this, there were no more emails. The family was concerned that this gold buyer potentially had kidnapped or hurt Chris, but Chris was going long periods of time between his emails to family, and so they figured, you know what, Paul's trip to Costa Rica where he's going to meet up with Chris is coming right up, so let's hold off doing anything drastic until then. But when February of 2011 rolled around, and it was time for Paul to fly out to Costa Rica to meet up with Chris, before Paul left, he called the hotel in Costa Rica to confirm the reservations Chris had supposedly made. And the hotel said, we've never heard of Chris Smith. There are no reservations under his name. And so Paul tried to contact Chris, but to no avail. And so Paul told his family about it, and they decided it was best for Paul not to go to Costa Rica because probably Chris wasn't there. And the family instead got in touch with the State Department and asked them if they could help them find their son, their brother. And right away, the State Department discovered Chris's passport had never left the United States. And his family said that was impossible because for the past year, Chris has been sailing around the world. But the State Department said, this is what we got. So Chris's dad, who used to be a cop, drove out to California to speak to Ed, who was the last person to see Chris before he left on this vacation. And Ed would say he has no idea where Chris is. However, he did say Chris had a fake passport, and that might be why his passport was not showing up as leaving the country. Chris's father didn't really know what to make of this information, and so he decided it would be best to just file a missing person report and put the investigation in the hands of the police. 
Shortly after the report was filed, the police brought Ed in for questioning, and Ed reiterated that he didn't know where Chris was and that he did have this fake passport. And he also said that they had not ended on good terms. They were kind of fighting and bickering at the end, and that's why he hadn't heard from Chris since he left. Ed was cooperative and didn't really have much to give police, and so the police let him go. While the police hit dead end after dead end in this missing person case, the property manager of the office building where the 800 exchange business had been located was growing increasingly frustrated. Shortly after Chris had sold his portion of the business to Ed and then gone on this vacation, Ed had moved 800 exchange from that office building to another, and Ed had not paid his final rent, which was $40,000. And this property manager had repeatedly tried to get in touch with Ed, but Ed was totally blowing him off. One day, the property manager was griping about Ed and his delinquent payment to another tenant in the office building, a guy by the name of Joe Delu, who just happened to be a private investigator. And during this discussion, the manager was saying that not only had Ed not made this payment, but he had also been recently questioned by police about his missing business partner who was still missing. And so Joe is immediately intrigued by this. And he says to the manager, you know, it sounds like Ed is a pretty shady guy. Would it be possible for me to just poke my head around their old space now that it's vacant? Because you never know, there could be something in there. And so the manager said that was fine. He opened the door to the old 800 exchange space. Joe walked inside and immediately found blood spatter on the door frame of where Chris's office used to be. He also found blood spatter on the ceiling and on the walls. And so Joe called the police who showed up and sprayed luminol all over Chris's office and there was blood everywhere. It would turn out Chris didn't sell his portion of the business to Ed. On that day, June 4th, 2010, Chris did go into the office to try to reach some agreement with Ed. But when he walked in, Ed promptly killed him with a knife or some other blunt object. Then he, or someone he hired, dumped Chris's body somewhere. After that, Ed stole all of Chris's money to pay off the debt to LG Tech, as well as some other large debts in Las Vegas. And then after that, Ed hijacked Chris's email accounts and pretended to be Chris for almost an entire year. Chris never took a boating trip around the world. He never broke up with Erica and had this new girlfriend from Playboy. He just got killed inside of his office and Ed created this ridiculous elaborate lie that was designed to make his family believe that Chris had become unstable and that maybe he did end his own life or maybe he did get kidnapped or killed in the Congo. Ed was just trying to create that seed of doubt that he had anything to do with it. But in 2018, it all came crashing down for Ed when a jury convicted him of killing Chris and sentenced him to life in prison without the possibility of parole. To this day, Ed maintains his innocence, and to this day, Ed still will not give up where Chris's body is. December 18th, 1956, a brand new game show called To Tell the Truth aired on a major American television network. The premise of the show was relatively simple. Four celebrity judges would be presented with three people called contestants who all claimed to be the same person. And this person who they claimed to be was always remarkable in some way. They had some incredible talent or some crazy job or they had accomplished something extraordinary. One of these three contestants was the real person they were claiming to be. The other two people were doing their best to pretend to be that person. And it was the job of the celebrity judges to try to figure out who was telling the truth. So for a set amount of time on the show, the celebrity judges would ask the contestants questions about their background and try to figure out, you know, who was who. And then at the end of the time, the celebrities would cast a vote about who they thought was the real remarkable person. After the votes were tallied up, the host would have the real remarkable person stand up to reveal themselves and the entire audience would go crazy, and that was the show. And the show became quite popular. So popular, in fact, that today, nearly 70 years later, it's still on the air. And over this show's very long history, virtually all the episodes are pretty similar. It's a pretty redundant show. But there is one episode that will forever go down as the most unique. In October of 1972, three contestants walked out onto the stage in front of the four celebrity judges, and they all introduced themselves as Ed Edwards. 
Then the host of the show read aloud the biography of the real Ed Edwards. And he would say that Ed at one point was on the FBI's list of the top 10 most wanted criminals in America for crimes like armed robbery and impersonating a federal officer. And then after he was finally caught by law enforcement and went to prison, a prison guard helped him turn his life around. And then upon release from prison 14 years later, Ed remained this reformed criminal and became a successful author and motivational speaker who specialized in telling people how to identify con men and criminals and how to protect themselves from these people. After the real Ed Edwards biography was read aloud, the three contestants sat down and the celebrity judges began asking them questions about their past. And then after the time was up, the celebrities cast their votes and then the real Ed Edwards was revealed. And even though two of the four celebrity judges had correctly identified the right Ed Edwards, the crowd was totally astonished at who this guy actually was because he did not look like this ex-convict. He looked like this kind of all-American, middle-aged father who was totally harmless and wouldn't hurt a fly. But either way, the show ended and then the world forgot about Ed Edwards. Until 2009. That year, Ed's estranged daughter, 40-year-old April Blasio, finally decided to investigate something that had plagued her for her whole childhood. Despite her father's claims that he was this reformed criminal and this stand-up, law-abiding guy, she didn't believe it. She never believed it. She thought he had never been reformed and just was a criminal and always had been. Behind closed doors, Ed was violent and abusive and he was a compulsive liar. She remembered in the 1970s and 80s when she was a young kid, Ed would make their family pack up and move sometimes in the middle of the night and April always assumed it was because her dad was wrapped up in something criminal. But every time she asked him, he would say, oh, well, you know, I was an informant when I was in jail and I snitched on some people and some of those people figured out where we live, and so we got to move. April knew he was lying, but there was nothing she could do, and so they just kept on moving around. But she always thought something else was going on. So in 2009, when April is now this 40-year-old woman, she's laying in bed one night and finally says, you know what, I'm just going to start Googling some stuff. So she hops in her laptop and she starts typing in the different names of towns that she and her family lived in as a kid. And then after she'd write the name of the town, she'd write unsolved mystery or unsolved crime and she would see if anything popped up. And so as she began looking, she found one in 1980. It was an unsolved murder in a town called Watertown, Wisconsin that happened right around the time that her family very briefly lived in this town. There was this young teenage couple that had left this wedding and they had driven down this dead end road and they were just kind of enjoying each other's company when an unknown assailant who matched the description of Ed Edwards walked up to their car, broke in, shot them both to death and then disappeared. And so on a hunch, April called the Watertown Police Department the following day and told them that I think my father might have been responsible for this double homicide. It's just a hunch, but he matches the description. We were there in this very small window of time when it happened. And so the police said, OK, we'll go have a look. And so the Watertown police, they tracked down Ed Edwards, who was living in Kentucky at the time, and they got him to give them a DNA sample. And when they tested the DNA sample, it matched the samples that were taken at the crime scene in 1980. And so Ed Edwards, he was arrested and brought back to Wisconsin. And as soon as he was in custody, he confessed to the murder. And then he requested the death penalty. But he was told the maximum punishment for this crime was life in prison. Ed didn't like this. And so he confessed to another double homicide from 1977 in Ohio, where he killed another teenage couple, thinking that would give him the death penalty. But through a loophole, they said, well, actually, that still won't get you the death penalty. You're still facing life in prison. And so frustrated, Ed revealed a third murder he had perpetrated. In 1996, he had killed his own foster son for the insurance money. And so for this crime, he was eligible for capital punishment. And so he was sentenced to death. But he would die of natural causes two years later in 2011 before the state could execute him. Since his death, cold case investigators and members of his own family have theorized that Ed Edwards is almost certainly responsible for more killings beyond just the five he happened to confess to. In fact, many people believe Ed Edwards could actually be the infamous Zodiac Killer, who's one of the nation's most notorious uncaught serial killers that killed 37 people in Northern California in the 1960s and 1970s. 
If this is true, then Ed Edwards did not become a killer after he was on that game show in 1972. No, when he showed up for that game show and stood in front of the audience and smiled and answered questions to the celebrity panelists, at that time, as you're watching him on TV, he would have already been a seasoned serial killer with dozens and dozens of victims. But Ed stopped confessing to murders after that third confession because he was just kind of using those murders as bargaining chips to get what he wanted, the death penalty. And once he got it, he went silent. And now that he's dead, we're never gonna get another confession out of him. And there's no proof connecting him to any unsolved murder cases. And so unfortunately, it's unlikely we'll ever know the full extent of Ed's reign of terror. In March of 2015, 68-year-old Tamara Samsonova was having renovations done to her home in St. Petersburg, Russia. A friend of hers, 79-year-old Valentina Ulanova, had heard about Tamara's renovations, and she approached her and said, do you want to stay with me while that's getting done? Tamara was very thankful, immediately said yes, and as soon as she moved in, she immediately started picking up the slack by cleaning up the house and doing the dishes and made sure she always cooked food for her friend because she wasn't able to pay rent. After a couple of weeks, the renovations on Tamara's home were complete, but Tamara didn't want to leave. She was really enjoying living with Valentina, and so she asked Valentina would it be okay if she stayed a little bit longer. Valentina was a little bit reluctant, but did ultimately say, okay, that's fine. A couple of months go by, and Tamara is showing no sign that she plans on leaving Valentina's home anytime soon, and Valentina is getting increasingly frustrated with that reality. Finally, in late July 2015, Valentina confronts Tamara and says, you gotta go. And Tamara just says, no, I'm not leaving. This causes a huge fight, but at the end of it, Tamara still doesn't leave. So for a couple of days, the women just do not speak to each other. The silence is finally broken on July 23rd when the women get into a fight about some empty cups in the sink that one of them was supposed to clean, but they didn't, and they fought about whose responsibility it was to do the dishes. And then of course, the whole subject comes up again of Valentina saying, you shouldn't even be here, you need to leave. And Tamara's like, no, I'm not gonna leave. And so another big blowout fight happens. But at the end of this fight, Tamara finally concedes and says, okay, I get it, I need to leave, just give me a couple of days and I'll be out of your hair. Immediately, the tension is gone in the room, they're no longer fighting, and Valentina is happy that she's finally gonna get her apartment back, and Tamara says, look, I'll make us dinner tonight, I'll go out and get some food. Tamara leaves the apartment and goes to a pharmacy and gets a whole bunch of sleeping pills, and then she gets the ingredients to a particular salad that she knows Valentina really likes. She goes back, she starts making dinner, and as she's making the salad, she crushes up the sleeping pills and mixes the powder with the salad dressing and gives that to Valentina. And Valentina, who's very hungry, eats the whole salad and doesn't notice anything is wrong. As soon as Tamara was sure Valentina had eaten the entire salad, Tamara just goes up to her room and goes to bed. A couple hours later, at about two in the morning, she goes back down to the kitchen and she sees Valentina is passed out on the ground. Tamara goes up to her and sees that she's still breathing, which was a disappointment because she wanted her to die from taking all these sleeping pills, but it doesn't matter. She takes out her hacksaw that she had borrowed from the neighbor earlier in the day and proceeds to butcher Valentina. And she makes special care as she's cutting her into pieces to remove her lungs and not damage them because Tamara had a taste for human lungs. It was actually her favorite food. She took Valentina's head and she put it into a big pot of water and began boiling that to eat it. The rest of her was cut up into as small of pieces as she could get them and then wrapped in a shower curtain and placed in various bags. As Valentina's head and lungs are being cooked on the stovetop, Tamara begins making dozens of trips from the apartment, down the stairs, out the front door, all the way down to the lake that was near their property where she would dispose of the body parts before coming back and getting more. Valentina's hips and legs were apparently too heavy to haul all the way down to the lake, so she took them to a nearby forest. Tamara's final trip sees her carrying a big silver pot inside of which is Valentina's head, or at least whatever is left of it after Tamara was done eating most of it. Four days later on July 27th, a young couple that was living in the same apartment complex as Tamara and Valentina were out for a walk with their dog out near that lake. 
And as they're walking, their dog takes off running and stops in front of this huge bag that it's sniffing and pawing and trying to open. And the owners of the dog try to call it back, but they can't get it to get away from this bag. And so the owners walk over and they kind of poke the bag. They can see it's pretty heavy and they open it up and they find a human torso and it's Valentina's. When the police show up, the first thing they do is they go to Valentina's apartment and they're surprised to find Tamara living there. They're kind of sensitive with her and they say, your friend, your relative uh, was just found deceased and we need to look around the apartment. Tamara was completely indifferent. She did not care. They had just discovered her body and she didn't care that they were searching the apartment. It was like she knew someday this was going to happen. During the search, the police officers quickly find blood all over the bathroom and in the kitchen. They even find the hacksaw she used that's got blood on it. And they find Tamara's diary that's sitting next to this book about black magic. And the police are horrified when they see that the diary contains meticulous notes that Tamara had kept of all of the ritualistic killings she had perpetrated over the past 20 years. And there was 14 of them and almost all of them were motivated by Tamara's desire to cast spells that she apparently was reading about in these black magic books she had. And virtually all of these spells required human flesh or other human components. And so she would kill these people, she would use their bodies to cast these spells, and then afterwards she would consume them. Not because that had anything to do with the spell, but because she liked the way people tasted, in particular human lungs. The police arrest Tamara, who doesn't put up a fight, and she says, yep, you got the right person, I did all this. While Tamara was on trial, she seemed like she was in a great mood. She told the judge, I hope you give me a really severe punishment. I expect to die in prison. She was seen blowing kisses to reporters. It was like she was just totally out of touch. Or maybe she literally knew this was going to happen and just didn't care anymore. Tamara, who would be nicknamed the Granny Ripper by newspapers over the course of this trial, was given a life sentence, and to this day, she is still sitting in jail. By most people's standards, Susan Monica's life had been pretty good. She had a small but very close group of friends, she had a great job working as an engineer, and she lived in one of the most exciting cities in the world, San Francisco, California. But Susan was not happy. Moving to the big city was not so much a choice as it was a product of life and circumstance. Deep down, Susan had always been someone who preferred peace and quiet and being alone, things that were in rare supply in a big city like San Francisco. Many nights after work, Susan would come home to her apartment and she would sit there and dream about moving away from the city and living off the grid somewhere on a farm, you know, raise her own food and be totally self-sufficient away from everybody else in the world. And then one day in 1991, when Susan was 43 years old, she made that dream a reality. That year, she wound up purchasing a 20-acre farm located in a forest in a little town in Oregon called Weimar. However, this farm was really not a farm. There was nothing on it. There was no house for Susan to live in. There was no barn for her animals or tools. There was no running water, no electricity, no septic system. It was just pure Oregonian wilderness. But to Susan, it was perfect. The property kept her far away from other people, and she liked the idea of having to literally build her own farm. After all, she was an engineer by trade, so she actually knew how to build buildings efficiently and safely, and she was a big, strong, sturdy woman who was not afraid of manual labor. So when Susan finally arrived in Weimar and made her way up the winding dirt road through the forest and arrived in front of her property and looked out at the vast, rugged landscape for the first time, she was filled with a rush of excitement. Even though there was nothing on her 20 acres, it already felt like home. Over the next several months, Susan would transform these 20 acres into a neat little farm, complete with a big barn and a shack for her to live in and a few animal pens for livestock. However, after the farm was built, Susan realized that building the farm was actually not the hard part. The hard part was maintaining the farm, going out there every day and doing all of her chores, feeding all the animals and doing all the different projects she had in mind. It was exhausting. And so not long after the farm was complete, Susan realized that as much as she wanted to be totally alone out there, she had to set that aside and hire some help. 
And so Susan printed out all of these help wanted flyers and put them all over town in Weimar. And before long, people began making their way up to her property to inquire about the role. Most of these applicants were people who struggled to find work elsewhere, either because they lived a sort of transient lifestyle, bouncing around from place to place so no one was ready to hire them long term, or because they had a criminal record and just straight up could not get a job. But Susan didn't care about either of those things. All she cared about was the people she hired would work hard and they would respect the peaceful, calm atmosphere she was fostering on her farm. Basically, do the work and leave me alone. And over the next 20 years, Susan would find dozens of people who were able to do just that. Most of them would work for Susan only for a short period of time. Others would stick around for a little bit longer, but eventually all of Susan's workers kind of rotated pretty quickly and moved on to other things. And when that happened, Susan would simply put up more help wanted flyers in town and hire more people. And in all the 20 years that Susan had been hiring these temporary workers at her farm, after they did move on and went somewhere else, Susan never heard about them again. However, that was about to change. On January 1st, 2014, Susan, who was 66 years old by this point, was outside of her shack out on her driveway when she happened to look up and see a car coming up her road. Now remember, she lives in the middle of nowhere. No one comes out to see her. So this is a very rare event. And so Susan is totally keyed in on this car. And this car, they pull into her driveway and then out of the car pop three young people. It was two young men and one young woman. And before Susan could even ask them who they were or why they were here, they were telling her. They said they were looking for their father, Robert Haney, who at one point had told them he was working on Susan's farm in exchange for a little cash. And also Susan was letting him park his camper on her property and he was living in that camper. The kids said their father always checked in with them at least once every couple of months, but they had just gone this really long stretch without hearing from him. And since he didn't have a cell phone and no permanent address, they had no real way of getting in touch with him. And so they were out there looking for him to make sure he was okay. And so they asked Susan, do you remember our dad, Robert? And if so, do you know where he is? Even though this whole situation was totally surprising for Susan because she almost never got visitors. So that alone was kind of jarring for her. But when she heard the kids say their dad's name, Robert Haney, she immediately knew who that was. Susan told them that she had hired their father the previous spring to help build a structure on her farm. And initially, Robert was really nice to have around the farm. He worked really hard, he kept to himself, he was quiet, and he had a dog that was really friendly and loving. But in August of the previous year, so five months into Robert's employment on Susan's farm, Susan would tell them that their dad totally changed. He started drinking really heavily and not really working very much and spending a lot of the day just kind of ranting and raving outside of his camper about how he wanted to exact his revenge on someone. Susan would eventually find out that what Robert was talking about is apparently one of his kids had been assaulted and he felt very guilty that he had not been there to protect his child. And so the way Robert was handling this guilt was by drinking and thinking about getting his revenge on the attacker. Now, while Susan did understand why Robert felt the way he did and why he was kind of acting the way he was, it didn't change the fact that Robert's behavior had become very disruptive on her farm. And the one thing Susan really wanted was peace and quiet. And so she decided she would have to go confront Robert about his behavior and potentially fire him if he couldn't find a way to calm down. But before Susan ever had to do that, Robert one day just walked right up to her shack. He handed her an envelope filled with cash and he asked Susan if she wouldn't mind looking after his dog for a while. And Susan was so taken aback by his complete change in behavior and this request that she just took the envelope and said, okay, I'll look after your dog. And then Robert nodded as thank you. He turned around and he walked away from her. And then a few moments later, Susan's standing there with the envelope in hand, watching as Robert is climbing into some white car that had just pulled up in front of the property. She didn't know who was in the car with him. And then the car turned around and drove out of sight. Susan told the kids that that had happened back in September, so about four months ago. And since he left, she had not heard from him, despite the fact she still had his dog. And she told the kids that a lot of Robert's stuff was still in his camper. Susan brought the kids over to the side of her property where Robert's camper was. And when they went inside, sure enough, all their father's things were all over the place. But the one item that immediately stood out to them was their father's tool belt. 
They knew their father was a traveling handyman. That was how he made his living. And so it begged the question, why would he leave his tool belt here if he knew he was going to be gone for several months, potentially? It didn't make any sense. After leaving Robert's camper, the kids thanked Susan and asked her to please be in touch if she learned anything else about their dad, and she said she would. And then the kids got back in their car and they began driving south towards the Jackson County Sheriff's Office. When they got there, they asked to file a missing person report for their dad. However, they learned very quickly that it was going to be very challenging to locate their dad because their dad lived this transient lifestyle with no cell phone, he had no permanent address, he had nothing that could really be traced. But the investigators agreed with Robert's children that their dad's absence was a big concern given the fact that his last interactions with Susan had consisted of him drinking very heavily and talking about going and getting his revenge on his child's attacker. And so the sheriff and the deputies were very concerned that that was exactly what Robert had done. He had gone out and potentially murdered someone and now was in hiding. So they asked Robert's kids if they could think of absolutely anything that could possibly allow investigators to track down Robert. And at some point, one of the kids said, oh, what about my dad's EBT card? EBT cards, or electronic benefit transfer cards, are like debit cards for state welfare services. You can use the cards to buy things like groceries, and the cards are definitely traceable. A few days later, when Robert's EBT card trace came back, investigators saw the card had been used just one month earlier in a Walmart located about 30 minutes southwest of Susan's farm. Now, this trace obviously didn't tell investigators where Robert was right now or what kind of condition Robert was in, but they had no other leads to operate on, so they decided they would go to the Walmart and see what they could find. When they got there, the investigators were led to the back room of the building where they were able to review the security footage from the previous month when Robert was supposedly there with his EBT card. But after reviewing hours and hours and hours of footage, the investigators never saw Robert on camera. However, they did see Susan on camera and unbelievably, she was the one using Robert's EBT card. And so obviously this was very suspicious and right away the investigators left the Walmart, went back to their office and began the process of getting a search warrant to search Susan's farm. A few days later on January 10th, the sheriff and his deputies arrived at Susan's property and when they pulled onto her driveway, Susan came outside to greet them. When she asked them, you know, what's going on? They told her, hey, we're here to search your property in connection with Robert Haney's disappearance. And before Susan could ask any more questions, the sheriff said to her, hold on, just turn around, let's go back inside, I need to talk to you privately. And so Susan, who was very shocked by this, just said, okay, and she turned around and led the sheriff into her house while the other deputies fanned out across the property to begin this big search. Once inside of Susan's house, they sat down in her kitchen and right away the sheriff says to Susan, okay, I have you on camera using Robert's EBT card. I know you stole it, so you need to tell me where Robert is right now or it's gonna get a whole lot worse for you. And as soon as he said this, Susan's look of shock on her face quickly turned into a look of kind of relief. It was like suddenly she understood what was going on here. And she says to the sheriff, no, I didn't steal his EBT card. He gave it to me along with an envelope full of cash when he left four months ago. And he told me to use it to buy dog food for his dog that I'm looking after. And since Robert had been gone for all these months, she had run out of cash to pay for the dog food and now was using the EBT card. Susan also added that if she had just stolen the card from Robert, she wouldn't be able to use it because it requires a PIN number, and Robert gave her the PIN number. That's how she was able to use it. The sheriff was not totally sold on Susan's story, and so he continued to ask more questions, trying to trip Susan up about how she came to acquire this card, but Susan was very firm that Robert had given her the card, and that was it. And so after several minutes, the sheriff realized that Susan was likely telling the truth, which meant the EBT card angle was likely a dead end and they would have to call off the search. But as the sheriff was standing up to leave the kitchen and leave the property altogether, a deputy from outside came running into the kitchen and without saying a word, just bent down and whispered something into the sheriff's ear. And as the sheriff is listening to this deputy, his face is contorting in disgust. He can't believe what he's being told. And after the deputy stands up and leaves the kitchen, the sheriff takes a deep breath and then looks at Susan and says, ma'am, you're gonna have to come with us. 
Back at the station, a now very flustered Susan was led into a small interrogation room where she sat down looking totally anxious. She's looking around, wondering what's going on. And then the sheriff walked into the room, immediately hit record on the camera, and then looked at Susan and says, has anyone died on your property? The story that Susan would tell the sheriff that day in the interrogation room was so completely unexpected and horrific, it would make headlines all across the country. Before Susan began this story, she told the sheriff that everything she had said about Robert Haney's disappearance had been the truth. However, she had left one little detail out. After Robert had handed Susan that envelope full of cash and the EBT card, and then climbed into that stranger's car and driven away, after that, Robert had actually come back to her farm and recently. Susan said she discovered his return when one morning she got up and she went outside to go feed her animals when she looked over at the pig pen and saw all the pigs who would normally be laying down and lounging around at that time of the day. They were all up and they had converged in one portion of the pig pen and they had kind of formed a circle around something on the ground as if they were all trying to look at something on the ground. Now, Susan said this was totally uncharacteristic, so obviously something weird was going on. And so Susan dropped her food and rushed over to the fence. She climbed into the pig pen, and as she got closer and closer to all these pigs, she realized they weren't just looking at something on the ground, they were eating something on the ground. And so Susan goes right up to this ring of pigs, and she begins pulling them aside, and then right in the middle on the ground is Robert. He was laying on his back and his insides had all been torn out. It was like the pigs were disemboweling him. And the most shocking thing is Robert was still alive. He was moving his arm and groaning. Susan tried to pull the pigs off of Robert, but she said they kept coming back and really aggressively continued to eat Robert. It was like they were in this feeding frenzy. And so Susan said, you know, I thought about lifting him up and moving him, but Robert was practically split in two, and she felt like if she tried to move him, that would kill him anyways. And so Susan said she did the thing that she thought was right at the time. She left the pig pen, went into the barn, got a shotgun, ran back to the pig pen, raised the weapon, and fired it into Robert. Susan told the sheriff that this was purely an act of mercy. She was ending his suffering. After Robert was dead, Susan said she just left the pig pen, and then three days later, she went back into the pig pen with bags and collected the little bits of Robert that had not been eaten by her pigs. And then she took those bags of remains and chucked them into her barn on top of the trash pile. But clearly, Robert's remains had not remained in the barn because the thing that deputy had whispered into the sheriff's ear when the sheriff was talking to Susan in the kitchen was... Sir, we found a leg outside. It was Robert's leg, and it was found not inside of the barn in the trash pile, but out in the middle of her property, just out in the open. Susan, when confronted with that information, suggested that, you know, maybe a wild animal had gone into the barn, got a hold of it, and dragged it off. The sheriff didn't even know what follow-up questions to ask, and so he just said, well, why didn't you call 911 when you first saw Robert? I mean, maybe we could have saved him. Or at least after he was dead, why didn't you tell someone? Susan would say that the reason she didn't tell anyone is she was afraid that if word got out about what her pigs had done, then her pigs would be euthanized and she would lose a major revenue stream because she sold her pigs meat in town. And she said even if her pigs were not euthanized, she was worried people in town would not want to buy her pigs meat after they learned her pigs were attacking and eating humans. Susan would tell the sheriff exactly where they could find the bags that contained Robert's remains, and she even said she would take a polygraph test to show she was now telling the whole truth. But when she actually sat down to take the polygraph test, she kept fidgeting and coughing and doing these really dramatic sighs, and it was causing the test operator to get really inaccurate readings. And so when this first polygraph test was over, the results were inconclusive. And so the investigators made Susan take another test, but again, she continued to fidget and yawn. And so finally, the investigators in the room watching this happen just called off the test. And when they did, they said to Susan, you know, hey, we're going to search your farm. And if there is anything on your farm that you have not told us about, you're going to be in serious trouble because we're going to find it. At this point, Susan kind of stopped fidgeting and she looked up at the investigators. And after a long pause, she reached out across the table and grabbed a piece of paper and a pen. She pulled it back and she began drawing something. 
And after a few seconds, it became pretty clear she was drawing a map of her farm. And after the map was all drawn out, she drew a big X in the middle of it and then slid the map back across the table to the investigators. And she said, if you go to that X, you'll find Steven. And the investigators are like, who's Steven? We're talking about Robert. What are you talking about? Well, it would turn out Robert was not the only farmhand to die on Susan's property. In 2012, about a year before Susan hired Robert, she hired another man named Stephen Delacino. And according to Susan, Stephen was a lot like Robert. He was really easy to get along with, he was quiet, he worked hard. But at some point, Susan said they had a big falling out. Susan said she started to suspect that Stephen was stealing her guns in her barn, and so she went to confront him. And during this confrontation, they got into this big fight, and Susan said she didn't really remember all the details of what happened next, but at some point during this fight, a gun went off, and then Stephen fell to the ground in the middle of the pig pen with his head bleeding, and all of Susan's pigs suddenly swarmed him and began eating him. The stunned investigators again asked Susan, okay, if that really happened the way you said it did, why didn't you call 911 if this was like an accident? And Susan would say again that her big fear was her pigs would either be euthanized or word would get out that her pigs were eating people and the people in town would not want to buy her pig's meat because of that. In the end, as far-fetched as Susan's stories were about what happened to Robert Haney and Stephen Delacino, there was never any evidence that actually contradicted her claims. And so as a result, when Susan went on trial for murdering Robert and Stephen, it came down to whether or not the jury believed Susan. And they didn't. Not at all. They believed that Susan was completely lying, and that in reality, Susan, who was known to have a very quick temper, shot Stephen and shot Robert very much on purpose, and then threw them into her pig pen. We can only hope they were dead before her pigs began eating them. On April 21st, 2015, more than a year after Robert's children had reported him missing, Susan was convicted of two counts of murder for Robert and for Stephen, and two counts of abusing a corpse. She was sentenced to a minimum of 50 years in prison. While in custody, Susan would be overheard saying there were 17 other bodies buried on her property. However, when the police went out there and searched again very extensively, they never found any other remains. Thank you for listening to the Mr. Ballin Podcast. If you enjoyed today's stories and you're looking for more bone-chilling content, be sure to check out all of our studio's podcasts, not just this one, but also Mr. Ballin's Medical Mysteries, Bedtime Stories, Wartime Stories, and Run Fool. Just search for Ballin Studios on any podcast platform and you'll find all of them. If you want to watch hundreds more strange, dark, and mysterious stories, just head over to our YouTube channel, which is just called Mr. Ballin. So that's going to do it. I really appreciate your support. Until next time, see ya. Come with me. I want you to come with me. I need you to come for me. I want to come for you. So can you come for me, please? It'll never get better than this. It'll never get better than this. It'll never get better than this. Come with me. In the 1970s, a young woman and young man were on their very first date together, and it wasn't going very well. It wasn't going badly, it was just really, really awkward. They just were not meshing at all. And so as they're getting ready to leave and retire for the night, the guy is thinking to himself, I have nothing to lose here, we're probably not going to go on a second date. 
And he says to the woman, hey, do you want to not go home right now and actually come on a hike with me? And he goes, I know this sounds like a terrible idea, but hear me out. I go mountain climbing in this area called Provo Canyon. It's not that far from here. There are these beautiful trails that lead up the side of the canyon to these amazing scenic overlooks. And tonight it's a new moon, so there's great visibility. And I just think that you might enjoy it. And so at first, the woman is obviously a little bit hesitant. But when he says, look, I go hiking there at night all the time. I love it out there. And I promise if there's any weirdness, if you don't like being there, we'll just turn around and leave. It's totally safe. And so after a little bit of coaxing, she finally says, okay, you know what? That sounds fun. Let's go do it. And so their date that had been really awkward suddenly became really exciting. And the two of them were kind of like thrilled, like, wow, look at us making our way up for a nighttime hike through Provo Canyon. And so they arrive at the, the mouth of this canyon and they're both obviously excited and they hop out and they start walking up this trail that brings them into a heavily forested section of the canyon. Now to this point, the guy felt like this was a really great idea. He really had gone hiking here a bunch, and he really did know the area well. But as the trail brought them into the forested area, the guy remembers feeling this overwhelming sense of dread. He didn't know why, it was just like an overwhelming sense of anxiety that something bad was going to happen to them. But he had worked so hard to convince his date to come with him, and had convinced her it was safe that he's not about to let on to her that there was anything wrong with what they were doing. And so he put on, you know, his strong face and just kind of suppressed it and just kept on walking and, you know, holding her hand tight and they just continued their walk. But his sense of dread would just build and build to the point where he was really on edge. And what he didn't know, but would find out later, is that his date, the woman, she also had this horrible sense of dread as soon as they went into the forest. But she didn't want to tell him because she didn't want to seem like a party pooper because he seemed really excited about it. At some point as they're walking down this path, the man steps on something that felt soft. He didn't know what it was, but it caused him to freeze immediately. And he's holding her hand. It kind of jerks her to get her to stop. And before he can even look down and see what he's standing on, he hears rustling coming from the bushes just off the trail. She hears it too. And both of them, without saying a word to each other, because again, you got to remember, they're both really stressed. They haven't let on to the other how stressed they are, but they're both basically ready to leave. And so the two of them turn around and they hightail it out of there. He has no idea what he stepped on. They don't know what they heard in the bushes, but they don't care. The anxiety was so high, they just wanted to leave. Years later, that man and woman who had this very strange date would actually be married. And they'd be sitting down watching TV together and they're flipping through the channels and they land on an interview with a death row inmate. And the interviewer is asking the inmate, was there ever a time that you were almost caught red-handed? And the guy being interviewed says, yes, one time. I was in the forest up in Provo Canyon one night and a young couple came walking up the trail. I didn't see him. So I only had a chance to jump into the bushes right next to the trail. And the guy actually stepped on the body of a girl I had just killed. But for some reason, he didn't look down and see what he was standing on. And the two of them didn't notice me just a few feet away from them. They just turned around and walked away. Turns out that young couple had run into one of the worst serial killers of all time, Ted Bundy. Before Bundy was executed, he confessed to over 30 murders. But many people believe the true number of victims is much, much, much higher. Thank you for listening to the Mr. Ballin Podcast. If you enjoyed today's stories and you're looking for more strange, dark, and mysterious content, be sure to check out all of our studio's podcasts. They are this one, of course, Mr. Ballin Podcast, and we also have Mr. Ballin's Medical Mysteries, we have Bedtime Stories, and also Run Fool. To find those other podcasts, all you have to do is search for Ballin Studios wherever you listen to your podcasts. To watch hundreds more stories just like the ones you heard today, head over to our YouTube channel, which is just called Mr. Ballin. So that's going to do it. I really appreciate your support. Until next time, see ya.